We want to welcome all of His Glory Nation from east to west to north to south as we bring you the latest teaching in the book of Revelation, the revelation of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And here we are in chapter 12. Uh, before we go any further, we want to pray that the Holy Spirit will come down to be our true teacher in the living Word of God, which is our Savior, Christ the Lord. Okay, so you, we're getting into Revelation 12. They're going to be talking about the woman who is about to give birth. Uh, there's been lots of commentaries over the years about who this particular woman is. We'll explain to you who she is unequivocally based off scripture. Remember, as we started our series in the book of Revelation, it's unfortunate that most uh, uh, denominations, churches do not teach the book of Revelation. There's several reasons for that. The first reason they, most denomination teachers, uh, uh, churches, believe in something called replacement theology. Replacement theology is, again, very simplistic, is that the church has replaced Israel, and that couldn't be further from the truth. So if the church has placed, replaced Israel, they don't want to get into the allegorical reign of what they believe the book of Revelation is. And there is a big push from these denominations, and there's a big push from churches, mega churches today, to say, let's get away from the Old Testament. We don't need the Old Testament. All we need is the New Testament. Well, God says he, he gave us his 66 words for a purpose. Precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Everything is God breathed for our doctrine. And the unfortunate part of replacement theology, not only is it wrong, but they take an allegorical view of the book of Revelation. Yes, there's symbols in the book of Revelation, but all the symbols are explained throughout the scripture. Remember, the uh, Apostle John didn't have the ability of technology today to understand some of these things that were happening to him. And the more we look back at what the symbols are, the more literal they are as well. So we're going to show you some things that maybe 50 years ago people would have said, well, that symbol is this, but could that literally be true as well? We're going to show you that most likely, unequivocally, that it is a, 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 a symbol which is explained, but it also can be literal. God, the more you peel back the Bible, the more, you're, it, the more it is literal. And we're going to see you things outside of time and space that we didn't think could happen. For example, how, was, how, was, uh, uh, how, was they, how were they able to transport uh, a human body? In the book of Acts, we say, well, that's just supernatural. Well, we know science is now caught up with that. You can teleport. Scientists have teleported a Coke can 60 feet. We see that Jesus was, was taken up by Satan to look at all the kingdoms of the earth. How was Jesus taken outside of time and space to see every kingdom that ever would be? Because we are, list we, we are trying to rationalize the book of Revelation in our mind instead of our heart and without science. You know, Einstein's theory of relativity told us that time is a finite product. So it is, uh, it, it is not, it's not stagnant. It is, it can fluctuate based on many, many different scenarios and many different things. And time and space is, is not finite. The speed of light can change and there are more than one dimensionality. And we're gonna see this with Michael fighting against Satan and a dimensionality that Paul talks about in the spiritual realm. That's in a dimensionality that we cannot see in the human form. We're, we live in a three and a half dimension reality. God is outside of all dimensionality altogether. He can see the beginning and the end, and he can also show people the beginning and the end. That's why people have had supernatural experiences that are based on the Bible. They're being able to see things in the future. They're going back to see things that have happened. And we'll explain that as we go uh, in this incredible uh, book of God's revelation. And this is the revelation of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. This gives us hope. And that's another thing, these poor denominations, they say, we don't wanna, we don't wanna teach the book of Revelation because it's doom and gloom. No, it's not doom and gloom, not for the Christians. We know where our home's gonna be. And God says throughout the scripture, he tells his prophet Amos, God does not do anything unless he tells his bond servants, the prophets first. He wants you and he wants me to know what he's going to do tomorrow. He wants you to feel very comfortable and at ease and in love with him that if you give your heart to his son that you have eternal life and he wants to show you things that are outside of time and space. He wants to show you the future before it happens and that's the purpose of the book of Revelation. Revelation means the revelation of the Messiah, the Christ, the completion of the earth age and to tabernacle for those who love the Lord Jesus Christ with all their heart, their, their mind, and their soul 
to be with God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. So let's get into it. We'll explain it. Again, there's 840 references in the book of Revelation to the Old Testament. So you cannot possibly understand the book of Revelation unless you thoroughly read and understand in your heart because the only understanding of scripture is through the heart. And that's why we always invite the Holy Spirit. You get some of these uh, seminary vice presidents and doctorates who have their PhD in uh, theology and they get all intellectual up here and they can't see, you can't see the Holy Spirit right in front of their face. And that's not what the scripture's telling us to do. Over and over, God tells us throughout the scriptures, put your tablet of my word on your heart. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. It doesn't say love the Lord your God with all your mind and your heart. He did it for a purpose. purpose. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Then it becomes your soul. It becomes your essence. It becomes your DNA, who you are in him with love. And then it becomes into your mind. As I freak a lot of people out uh, when I say this, I say, you shouldn't memorize scripture. And people, I've had so many old school people just go, oh, I can't believe you're a pastor. And you say, don't memorize scripture. Oh, you, you're a heresy. You're a heretic, heretic. I said, well, listen to what I'm about to say. If you're trying to memorize scripture, it's kind of like in college or in high school and you're trying to cram for a test or in a, in a, to become a lawyer, you're, you're crashing for the bar exam. And I've had to crash for those types of exams in the, in, the, in the secular world. So you're just trying to put all that information in your mind just to get through that particular test. But when the test is over, you don't remember anything. So that's why I'm saying don't memorize scripture in your mind because you will forget it. God wants to meet you in his word and in, in the heart. Because if it gets into your heart, what does he say? Love the Lord with all your heart, then your soul, then it comes to your mind. You will naturally through the Holy Spirit, through your heart, your soul, then remember scripture and you'll understand what it means. So many people that are Christians, they'll throw a verse, they'll go, blah, 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 blah. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But they won't know what it means. What good is it throwing scripture against the wall if you don't know what it means? We want, God wants you to know what it means. And that's why we're gonna walk it through to see what God is telling us here. Now, a great sign appeared in heaven. Yeah, and this is what's called the Maseroth in the Hebrew. God has told us in the Torah that he will tell us the times and the seasons, the signs and everything will come through the astronomy of the Maseroth. Astronomy of the Maseroth is biblical. Astrology is not biblical. We stay away from astrology. What God has always made for good, Satan always tries to trick it and deceive for bad. So we stay away from astrology, we stay away from tarot cards, we stay away from sorcery, we stay away from witchcraft, we stay away from all that. But biblical astronomy based on the Maseroth, God is telling us, and he's telling us what these signs are going to be before they happen. And we're going to know if we study the Torah in Genesis, who this woman is based on what Joseph saw in his dream. This confirms that out of two witnesses, my, my word is established. So many people will say, well, this woman is the church. And, oh, so let's get through that and we'll explain that in a minute. Now, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun. The sun was shine on this woman. And with the moon under her feet and on her, her, on her head, a garland of 12 stars. What does that mean? Who is this woman? Many of you say, well, that's the church. As Chuck Smith famously said, Long ago, if this is the church, uh, we're in trouble because the church is supposed to be a virgin bride. This woman is pregnant and uh, this is not the church. This is the nation of Israel. The woman is Israel and she's giving birth to the Messiah because they have not realized that the Messiah has been born. So we'll go and explain. Remember when Joseph had his dream in, in Genesis and in, in, uh, Jacob, who is Israel, uh, pondered his dream saying, you, you, you're going to have your brothers and me bow down to you. And, uh, and he, but it, the, the, the scripture says he pondered it because J- Jacob was an in, could interpret dreams as well. So the sun and the moon are, are, are showing that the woman is the nation of Israel. Israel, remember after Revelation 4, everything turns to Israel. Jesus was talking about Matthew 24 to the nation of Israel. When this event happens, the abomination of desolation, get out of Dodge and go to Petra. So he's turned the focus on Israel. 
Why is Israel Israel's way, way, ready, waiting for Messiah Ben David today, the Jewish faithful? You got the two witnesses that are going to come in, and um, we're going to see that the woman is birthing the Messiah, and we'll explain um, is a symbol, but also how this could be literal as well. Then the be then being with child, she cried out in labor and gave uh, gave pain in pain gave birth. So that's showing you a, a dual a dual um, a dual symbol. Pain is the birth pains are speeding up literally at this particular time on earth because things are coming. The dragon is coming after the woman who is pregnant. The woman is Israel and she's birthing the Messiah. So this is a symbol. The woman is the symbol of Israel. The, the child is a symbol of the Messiah because the Judea, and Judaism, they are waiting for Messiah Ben David today. They missed the first uh, one when he came in as a child. Now, it's just my conjecture. We know the symbols mean that the woman is Israel, and we know the symbol is this is the Messiah. But it's my conjecture that this could be literal as well that in this time and space, they were able to go back in time and see that the Messiah was literally born in a manger exactly the way they missed it so that God is showing them. Uh, there's no question in my mind when the two witnesses come and the 144,000, they're preaching this to the gospel to people. Hey, the Messiah came and he's coming back again. He was born in a manger. He was born in Bethlehem according to the prophets and they're gonna show them. So this is not gonna be anything that's gonna shock the Jewish people at this particular point after the two witnesses and 144,000 spreading the word of the gospel around. And it's just my conjecture that God is gonna be able to take them back in time and literally see the birth of the Messiah, that he was there and now he's a man, he's coming back. The first time was the Lamb of God, the second time and he's gonna rule as an iron, as the lion of the tribe of Judah. So she's giving birth, and another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon. So we know the fiery red dragon is Satan. Uh, red dragon is uh, the serpent reference uh, throughout the scripture. Also, curiously enough, that is uh, a symbol of Leviathan and uh, the, the dragon of the sea in, in uh, dinosaurs and our study in the book of Job and our study in Genesis as well with the, with the Nephilim when they fell, the fallen angels. We're gonna see the angels again here. And uh, most likely these are part of the fallen angels that are uh, coming and make war against Michael and God's holy angels. Um, so uh, the, the, the dragon is always a representative of evil and God created the, the Leviathan and the behemoth to destroy the evil of, mankind, of, the, of the world because the fallen angels mated with the women, the Nephilim. So here we go again with the red dragon. He had seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns on his heads. So what does that mean? So the, the, the dragon who represents the, Satan himself, he's gonna have seven heads. Seven is the number of completion. Completion of a particular event. This will be the completion of Satan's access to the holy throne. Remember, uh, Satan today has access to the throne of God. He has access to the earth as well. And when you put your mind around that, it's hard to believe that God Almighty allows Satan to go up to the throne of heaven today. Yes, he was thrown out of heaven. He has no authority in heaven anymore, but he has access to heaven. And he goes up to heaven to try to deceive and to throw the, God's beloved people in front of the bus. And it is our intercessor, our high priest, Jesus Christ, who makes intercession to the judge, the high judge, the Father on our behalf. And so Satan has access to that. We see that in the book of Job, he goes in and tests him. We see that in the book of Yasser, where he did it to Abraham as well. Abraham loves uh, Isaac so much more than you, God. Why don't you test him, is what the book of Yasser tells us. And Satan was able to sift Abraham. Satan was able to sift Job. But this is coming to the completion, seven completion. The completion that Satan will have access to the heavenly throne. And now he knows his time is running out very, very, very quickly. Seven again is completion. Seven heads represent the seven mountains of authority throughout the earth. We call the seven pillars of the mountains of society. What the world puts in as their gods and their idols, Satan is the chief behind these seven pillars of society. We see today in the literal sense that God is bringing down the house of cards and the seven pillars of the seven heads of what man 
thinks of the world as, as, as uh, their idols and their man. They put it into movie stars, they put it into TV stars, they put it into government, they put it into uh, all these idol people, these seven heads and mountains of authority throughout the, uh, of, throughout the world. That's what Satan is representing here, the world. He doesn't care what you pick as long as it's not Jesus Christ. He wants you to be confused. He wants you to be deceived. So those seven heads, and it has 10 horns. T horn is always a symbol of authority. So these 10 horns have authority. And most will tell you these are 10 nations that have authority. But we have to take the number 10 even deeper. 10 is a number of precept and commandment. So there's a precept and commandment on these 10 and the precept and commandment can come with a judgment if you're not obedient. We know they're not going to be obedient. So there's going to be an ultimate judgment for these 10 nations and ultimately the red dragon who has seven heads. And he has seven crowns on his head, meaning they've given him the, uh, the authority that he thinks he is the king of these seven, these seven pillars of society, these seven mountains, these seven powerful things of the world each one of them have a crown they're the false crown the only crown will come with our messiah jesus christ his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth we know a third of the angels will go against uh, the lord this is where it's happening uh, we don't know if this is including the 300 that we read about in the book of yasser which were the watchers that came down and mated with the women in their study in genesis and created the offspring of what they'll call the nephilim and the rephaphim uh, remember that the, the pit was open and that's where they were stored. The pit was open. An angel came and opened up the pit. So all things are going crazy on the earth as we speak today or at this particular time. And the, so the third of the, of the heaven threw them to the earth. So they're thrown out of getting access to the heavenly throne. They only can stay now on the first and the second heaven. That means the earth and, and the uh, moon stars and, and Jupiter and all the, uh, what we call the, the, the second heaven. Satan has con uh, authority up until this coming point of the first and second heaven. But he had access to the third heaven, to God Almighty. And God's saying, no, 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 it's wartime. I've given people free will. I've given them chance after chance after chance after chance to repent. And these people are still hardened of the heart. I've shown them my, my son. I have shown them every single possible way. And they still are denying me. And I know the beginning and the end. I know each person's heart is going to be away from me. Remember, God is the God knowing all things. He knows the beginning. He knows the end. And he can take us outside of time. And he can take us out of space. We talk about, you know, some people will laugh at, at, at this probably 10, 15 years ago, they would even laugh at this. Yeah, okay, so you, God can literally, uh, in the book of Revelation 12, you're telling me that you, in your conjecture, you think that God could take the, the John back and the, nation, and the people of Israel back to see the birth of the Messiah way back when he really was born the first time? Yes, we've proven it through science, that science can go back in time. And that's part of Einstein's theory of relativity. Science tells you that it's possible today, that you can literally go back in time. And that's something 15, 20 years ago, we thought, ah, no way, all the doubters. So the more we're getting into technology, the more, obviously, the symbols are explained throughout the scripture. The symbols are, are always consistent throughout the scriptures. We know what the symbols mean. We know what the heads means. We know what the horns mean. We know what the, what the, who the woman is, and we know what the, the child is. It's a Messiah. All these symbols are explained, but the more we're getting deeper in technology, the more that this can actually become literal. It's amazing. Remember Jesus was talking about in the, in the time of the gospel, when the time of the harpazo, two women would be at the, in the grinding, two, two men would be out in the field, and two men, and I think it's in the, the gospel, Mark would be in bed sleeping. But wait a minute, that doesn't happen in Israel. How did Jesus talk about that in 30 to 33 AD? He knew about different time zones. There was no different time zones back then. It was impossible. Paul talks, talks in uh, Ephesians how high, deep, long, the breadth of long, the, the depth and length of the word of God. If you read this in the Greek, Paul is literally explaining a four-dimension reality, a four-dimensionality if you read this in the Greek. Wait a minute, Einstein didn't figure out uh, uh, the theory of relativity that time, or time is outside of, uh, uh, is not a finite property 
until the early 1900s. That's when his theory of relativity. How did Paul know? Because the Holy Spirit's showing him. How, how, how were they able to teleport? We're seeing that you can teleport today. How was, again, as we said earlier, how was Satan able to take Jesus up to the pillar and show him the, all the kingdoms of the world and to, to try to get him to take the shortcut? That was not a figure of speech. He was able to show him future kingdoms, future kingdoms of the earth, exactly the way the apostle John is seeing. John is seeing something and in, 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 in time that has not come yet. It's something that has not happened to us yet today. But as Daniel tells us in Daniel 12, uh, it means twofold. Don, Daniel says that, that knowledge will go to and fro. In the end days, now knowledge will go to and fro. He doesn't necessarily mean your uh, your iPad. You know I mean, your iPad is giving us knowledge. You've got more power in this iPad today than you did in a supercomputer 20 years ago. It's just amazing. The technology is, is speeding up. Uh, the, the life cycle of a, a technology a phone or a tablet or a computer is about six months before it doubles in its, in its computing. Uh, he's not talking just about that. He's talking about the knowledge of God as well. More things will be revealed in the end days. Signs and wonders and proof to show God is truth and also technology. So technology is starting to catch up to show us these events. Yes, they're symbols, but they most likely are gonna be a literal uh, part of this as well. And John is trying to explain this from 2000 years ago, not having the ability to say what an iPad is. So here we go, they threw, the, uh, they threw to the earth, the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth, that's the Messiah, and devour her child as soon as it was born. Just like Herod tried to devour the Christ before he was born. Satan knows who the Messiah is and he's going to try to fight to destroy the, the, the birth child. The, 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 as Isaiah said, a son is given, a child is born. Isaiah didn't say the same thing twice. He's saying two different things. A, a, a child is, is born, a son is given. A child was born in a manger in the line of David. That is our Messiah, the, the kinsman redeemer. But he also said a son is given. It's two different things. The son of God was given to mankind to reconcile the, 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 the world through love and to take that redemption as the Lamb of God to the cross and then come back the second time as the kinsman redeemer to redeem the land. That's why we need to know the Old Testament. We need to know it inside and out. Gabriel who is a holy prophet or a holy angel in the Quran. He even tells us, he tells Mary in the, in the gospel of Luke, Mary, you're blessed. You will have the most high God. You're gonna have the most high God with a virgin birth. Going back to Genesis 3, 15, the seed of a woman, which is biologically incorrect. God told us in Genesis 3, 15, how he was gonna do it. Nobody could figure it out. Satan couldn't figure it out. He was born in a manger by a virgin birth. He is the son of God and a child is born because it had to be in the line of David because Gabriel's telling us. He'll be of his father, David, and his kingdom will never end, meaning the kingdom, the Davidic covenant. He will be a king in the line of David forever. He'll be the king of kings and Lord of hosts. And he'll rule over the house of Jacob forever. When God says forever, he means forever. It means he'll rule over the house of Israel because Jacob's name is Israel. He will rule there. That is from Gabriel of the Quran, who is a holy, holy angel, according to the Quran, telling us what the Messiah is going to do in the twofold. So devour the child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. He is the king of kings, Lord of hosts. He will rule out of Jerusalem. And we see in the Old Testament that David, King David, will be king of Israel again and he will get the throne of David again. Uh, four, or four or five prophets tell us that David will be king again. Christ will rule from the mercy seat in Jerusalem for a thousand years for the Davidic covenant of the world. All nations, as it says here, with a rod of iron, his authority, no authority will come up against him. That rod of iron, it should be called a scepter of iron, the power, the authority. As Jacob said, as he, he, he prophesied over Judah in, in um, Genesis, the scepter shall not leave Sha uh, Judah until Shiloh comes. This is where it's confirming 
Jacob's prophecy over his son Judah. Because what does that mean? If you study in our Genesis series, you'll know. But the scepter shall not leave Judah. That means the kingship, the authority, the rod of the kingship of Judah before even Judah was never a, a, a king. The, the kingship will never leave the tribe of Judah through David until, the, until Shiloh comes. Shiloh is an Old Testament uh, reference to the Messiah. And he is, he is completing that prophecy in Genesis from Jacob right here because the scepter will never leave the Messiah ever. He will have it. And her, her child was caught up to God and his throne. God, the Most High, takes his child, his only begotten son, who, as we saw in Genesis 5 code, was literally himself. He loved the world so much that he stepped down in the form of man and, and died on the cross for us so that we can be reconciled to him. And then God saved his son and brought him up to the throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she take place and has a place prepared by God. God has the woman, Israel, protected. And God is going to protect his beloved city. Gabriel told us he was going to do that. And the Jewish faithful will get it right in the end. As the, as the prophet said, I can't remember, I think it's Zechariah, that in the end, they, they, they will seek my face in their affliction. And I will return to the place that I left, is what the Lord says. So if you have to return, that means you were once there. Now he's returning back to his people to open up their eyes and open up their heart to know who he is. And more importantly, who the Messiah is, Messiah ben David. Then the woman fled into the wilderness and they should feed there for 1,260 days, three and a half years. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought. So Satan has angels too, the fallen angels, the third that have fell. And most likely the ones that went, the 300 that fell the first time and created the offspring of the Rephaim. Uh, the, the, the watchers as well. And this is a battle. The God is saying, Michael, the archangel, he's the warrior angel to protect his beloved nation. Michael is always called into battle to protect Israel. And Michael's coming to protect his beloved Israel. He's, he's fighting Satan because Satan is trying to kill the Messiah. Satan is trying to destroy the world because he knows the world will be reconciled through the Messiah in Jerusalem and then Israel. Why do you think the nations rage against the city of Jerusalem and the, and the nation of Israel? If you never believed in what we call replacement theology, all this knucklehead replacement heresy, replacement theology denominations from way back when that the church has replaced Israel. First of all, you don't even read your Bible if you think the church has replaced Israel. Paul talks about, about not, uh, Romans 9, 10, and 11, and he even gets bold and said, don't be ignorant, brethren. God is not protected. They have a temporary blindness until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. But in the end, they will get it. They will understand. Their eyes will be open, and more important, their heart will be open. God has never turned his eye on Israel. And May 14th, 1948, should have put a, a, a nail in the coffin to that heresy of replacement theology. Why did the nation of Israel be reborn? Why did he create the shekel again, the currency? Why are they speaking in Hebrew? It's exactly the way Ezekiel prophesied that would happen in the end days. And that is exactly what's happening in this generation. This generation that we're living in. We're living in the greatest generation of the Holy Spirit and the coming of the King. Every single prophet would have loved to have been in the time we're in today. And we have to open our, our, our heart, open our ears, open our eyes, and do all things for the kingdom glory because this is a glorious time. It's not a time of woe. This is a time to go in the name of the Lord Most High. So Michael and his angels fought against Satan and the red dragon and his angels, the fallen angels. There was a battle that's going on. Now, can Paul or can uh, John literally see this? He may be able to because God allows us to see angels. There's angels that are being able to see. I've mentioned this many times. Uh, my, son, my youngest son, who has a gift of prophecy, comes up with some incredible dreams, uh, has seen the angel two times. We, uh, my daughter has seen the angel who's the most skeptic of any person on the face of the earth. You tell my daughter the sky is blue and she'll say, no, it's, it's, it's pink. But she will never deny that the angel came to her in her room because I prayed for the angel to show himself so she would know who the living God is. And we had another member of our, um, our, our ministry, partner of our ministry, 
that has saw the angel in one of our Bible studies too. I see the angel go by all the time. I see the I see it in a different dimensionality, but I don't. I've never seen it in its its full glory as God as some of these others have seen it just glowing. And uh, we don't bow down to angels. We just but we we acknowledge how glorious this this fourth dimension is. That the spiritual realm is there and it's real. And it's not, and I don't, I, 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 it's just my conjecture, but I believe God is going to allow the people of the earth to see this battle happen in the natural. He's going to open up the blinding. Remember, people say, well, how can you do that? Science is showing us that we can do that. Six, uh, the sixth dimension in, at Cal State Uni or Caltech University, just, uh, it was about a year or two ago, said, from quantum physics of theory of the quantum physics of of of, of sex dimension, a human body uh, in quantum physics can physically walk through a wall in the sixth dimension. How did Jesus walk through the wall to his disciples? Science is now showing us that it that it is possible. All these things are now possible in the natural. So we can't poo poo them like oh that's just it can't. Besides, God is a God of miracles. He could do miracles anytime he wanted but he uses the natural to show his miracles as well. For him to open up the eyes for us to see the dimensionality of Satan and Michael fighting with the angels of good versus evil, that's nothing compared to him. Remember in the book of Kings, when Elijah the, 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 goes back to the, the Syrians, the king of Syria is like, how are they getting our battle plans? It's almost like they, 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 they tap the wires at Trump Tower and they got a spy inside our Syrian army. How do they know what we're going to do before they we're going to do it? Because God was given a prophecy to Elisha. And Elisha knew exactly what was happening. And he was telling the, the, the king of Israel exactly what the Syrian uh, king was going to do before he did it. And he was a spy. There was a literal spy. It's best to have the spy of God over man spy because man spy is going to get caught. God is doing it for his purpose and his glory. Man spy is doing it for their own greed and, and, and corruption. But Elisha was calm because he was getting all this. And all of a sudden, the Syrian king got all fired up. He says, it's because of Elisha. The prophet is, is, is tapping our lines. He's tapping our phone lines. He's got, a, he's got a spy in our midst. So they put the entire Syrian army around Elisha and his servant. And his servant looks out the window. He's freaking out. He goes, dude, the whole Syrian army's around us. We're dead. And Elisha can be in real calm. God, just this... This Bible humor here. Elisha says, don't, don't worry about it. And he looks at Elisha like, what do you mean don't worry about it? The entire Syrian army surrounded us. We're dead. It's just you and me, Elisha. I know you're a prophet, but it's two against this whole. And Elisha calmly says, Lord, will you open up his eyes and let him see? And we see in the scripture that, was, that God opened up the eyes of the servant. And he saw the chariot of, the, of, the, of all the angels are surrounded the Syrian army. And God had more. See, he said, there's more of us than there are of him. And that's exactly what's happening here. There's more of, uh, more of God's people with Michael, the archangel, fighting Satan than there are of Satan. And this is not an equal battle. Yes, it's a horrible battle. It's a tough battle. But God's got the battle beat. God won the battle through his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. This is just coming to revelation, revealing the end things. And this is coming to completion, the completion of the earth age so that we can be with him forever in his kingdom glory. God is finishing the work of the testing of man's heart. Do you choose me through my son, Jesus Christ? Or do you choose anything of the other seven heads of the seven pillars of society and the 10 crowns of the 10 nations of the corruption and greed and kings raging forever? What are you going to choose? In the hardened of heart, believe it or not, choose everything but the Most High God. But did, they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So they have no access to the third heaven any longer. That's just one of the more completion. Now he's forced them back. You see, he's forcing them back slowly, perfectly, on his perfect timing. God is getting everything put in place. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old. It's Lucifer, the one who said, why would you want to make a man when you got me, the great cherub? And that's why he fell. It was C.S. Lewis that believes that that's the reason he fell. And it's my conjecture, C.S. Lewis hit the nail on the head because Lucifer's pride brought him down because he knew God wanted to create man in his image. 
And he said, why would you create man in, 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 my, in your image when you have me, Lucifer, the great cherub that plays you the great music, the beautiful of all creation, the first of creation. So call the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. See, he's the deceiver. He is the deception. Whatever God means for good and light, Satan is trying to put the dark on it and spin it. That's why we have to be very careful. We teach in, the, in our gospel teaching that Satan's greatest ploy has been to attack the church from within. When you see the, the, the parable of the mustard seed and the birds of the air come into the mustard seed. We know the mustard seed is the seed of the word of God, which becomes the church, the ecclesia. That sounds really good. We're taught in Sunday school through denomination. That's a good thing. And look at all these beautiful birds coming in and nesting in the bush. The birds are, uh, as a generic, are a symbol of evil, meaning this is not a good thing. Satan's goal has always been from the beginning of the church is to attack the church from within. How does he do that? Through deception, trying to change the word of God, changing it like he tried to change with Eve. Did, did God didn't sur did, God surely didn't say this day you'll die. And she got confused and said, well, we're not even supposed to touch the, 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 the forbidden fruit. God never said anything about touching it. He said, don't eat it. See, Satan's always changing the words. He's adding to, he had the audacity in the, seven, uh, the three temptations of Christ to tempt the word of God, Jesus Christ, who was the author of the word, the creator of Satan, by saying, cast yourself down and, 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 and use, quoting Psalm and your angels will come to your rescue. But the next verse that Satan leaves out is the demise of himself. That's how crafty the serpent is. He's going to make it look like a 90% of Christian. And in the last 10%, he's going to get you to spin off. He wants you to learn from any other way but the literal and fallible word of God. And that's what Satan's doing in churches today. He's corrupting the churches and God's shining the light on these churches. The denomination churches attendance is falling and the growth of the literal and fallible word is growing eight times faster than anything out there. People are hungry for the truth, and the truth is the only thing that can set you free, the true word of God. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our Theos and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our, Elo, or before our Theos day and night has been cast down. So this is telling you, Satan day and night accuses and goes into the third heaven to try to accuse the brethren and it's glory coming to say that part is completed satan has no more access to cause havoc to come up and accuse anymore he's on the run he has been thrown out of heaven he has no access to the throne and worse yet that serpent is going to be put into Sheol. and then after the thousand year reign of the messiah the davidic covenant He'll go to his eternal home, the lake of fire, with the fallen angels and all those who remove their own name out of the Lamb's book of life. And they overcame him. How do they overcome it? How do you overcome Satan? Here it is. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, the perfect Lamb, the perfect Lamb, the Lamb of God. Jesus Christ is the only way to overcome the world and Satan to get to eternal life. And the word of their testimony, and their testimony is the gospel, the word of God, that is the, only the Christ can save. He is the shepherd. And there is one door through the shepherd gate. And he did not love their life, and, and they did not lo love their lives to the death. They gave it all up for God Almighty through the blood of the Lamb. It wasn't about greed and pride of self. It was about giving up self for the glory of God and saying, You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy. Praise your name, praise you. It's for your kingdom glory. And they became, uh, they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of the testimony and they did not leave their lives to death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, you who dwell in them. See, this is a time of rejoicing because the testing is over. Those who have accepted the Lord most high is seeing victory of evil right before their eyes. Because up until this point, we've seen Satan's having access to the throne no more. And it's starting to go boom, 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 boom. The birth pains are speeding up and his time is running out quicker and quicker and the scales of justice will finally be right. Now having the, uh, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the, and, and the sea. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea 
because the wrath of God is coming. The last half of the tribulation is far worse than the first part. And the wrath is coming. Now God has taken it, uh, taken it up a notch or two. And that means the earth and the sea, the sea is what gives up the death, the second death. There will be a punishment for the, those who denied the Lord into the second death. That will be to the lake of fire. And that's why there's no sea at the end of the book of Revelation. When the new heavens and the new earth are come, we see three things that are no longer. There is no sun, there is no moon because we're outside of Einstein's theory of relativity. We, we keep time by the sun, lunar, or solar, a solar or lunar calendar, the sun or the moon. And that's how we keep time and seasons and light. That's what God said. I made the light of the sun for the day and made the light of the moon for night when he created. That was for our earth. We don't need that anymore because Christ we will tabernacle with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit forever. No more sun and moon because he is the light and he has got control of time now. We don't worry about time. We're outside of time and space and there's no more sea. Why no more sea? Because sea is always an idiom of, of the second death, of sin, the sea. And there will be no more death. There will be no more second death. Everything has been taken care of. Praise his name. Now, when the dragon saw, because he knows that he has a short time, that's because, the, so the, well, I'll go back and read this. Uh, earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath. He knows that he has a short time. So he knows he has a short time at this particular point. He knows it's running out. He knows he has a short, he knows exactly he has seven years when the church is harpazo. So that's why he's dangerous with a harpazo. That's why Satan is attacking any ministry that preaches the true gospel and the true word of God and the truth of Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Because if you preach that, which most people don't preach that today, it's only a remnant that is preaching the truth because there's itchy ears. They want to tell their congregations what they want to hear. So they'll come back and give them money. It's not about money. It's about the love of Christ and saving souls. And we have to go against the flow and do what the Lord tells us. He says, preach the gospel from east to west to north to south to every creature. And that's what we're called to do. So those who do that, Satan is after them. He, they're attack, he, he's attacking them left and right. And they go through more trials and tribulations than anybody else. Why? Because they're a threat. He knows scripture. He knows what Paul said, the fullness of the Gentiles. He doesn't know the number. We don't know the number. Only God knows the number. But there's a number that there is a the completion of the fullness of the Gentiles, meaning that can come to Christ. And that's what will trigger the harpazo of the church. And he knows when the harpazo of the church goes up and the Holy Spirit goes up, boom, seven years counting. He knows at this point, he's been thrown out of heaven. He's got three and a half years left and the wrath is coming harder and harder. Now, when the dragon saw that he had been cast onto the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. He's persecuting Israel, exactly the way he's trying to persecute Israel today. Poor little Israel, a little a section of land the size of New Jersey, surrounded by people that are trying to destroy their a sense of being all the time, by terrorists of the old Persian Empire, of Iran trying to recreate the Persian Empire, uh, the, the Turks, which is Gomer in Ezekiel 38 and 39, trying to reestablish the Ottoman Empire through Hezbollah, which is Tyre and Sidon of the Psalm 83 war, which is the next one. Uh, Gaza Strip and West Bank, which is the old Philistines in the, in, the, in the Psalm 83 war, which is eminent. All Bible prophecies being coming to fruition right before our very eyes. That's why the nation of Israel and the city of Jerusalem is attacked. If you watch TV, the city of Jerusalem and the nation of Israel is on TV more than any by far, by far, because Satan's got it out for that because that is God's holy city and his Messiah is gonna put his peg there. And what did Jesus tell us in the church of Philadelphia? If you do not deny my name and you do not deny my word and you stay strong and you persevere and you finish the race, I'll make you a pillar in my new Jerusalem. That means we get to be in Jerusalem with him. How can you not love Jerusalem when the God of the universe loves it? If you don't love Jerusalem, then you gotta question yourself, do you really have a deep love relationship with God? If that is his glorious thing in, in, of all places on earth, his beloved city, how can you not love Jerusalem? But the woman was given two wings and a great eagle, the wings of a great eagle, the eagle representing 
as one of the four uh, symbols of the four tribes of, of, of Israel. Remember back to the sun and the moon, the 12 stars that were with her, uh, with, uh, surrounding the, uh, around the, the woman with the 12 tribes of Israel, or the, you know, the 12 tribes of Israel to, to realize that the Messiah is going to be born. So the eagle is one of the symbols of the four tribes and the eagle is taken away and the eagle is going to protect her and protect her from the dragon. Where she is nourished for a time and times and a half for the presence of the serpent. So I mean, God is protecting his beloved in these end times because he's going to bring them home. They're going to know who the Messiah, who the Messiah truly is, the Christ. And Satan is trying to destroy as many as he possibly can because he's frantic. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood, trying to kill her. But the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Can that literally happen? Absolutely. Satan has demonic uh, ability, just like Pharaoh and his sorcerers had demonic ability. But what Satan has is nothing compared to what God can do. Can God open up the earth and swallow the water up? Yes, because he did in the Old Testament. Remember, he swallowed it up and they, the people went in that were going against Moses. He literally swallowed them up. So this is something that's not a figure of speech. God can and has and will do these events because he is the great I am that I am. There's nothing he can't do. And the dragon was enraged with a woman. <laughs> the dragon is enraged with Israel today and will continue to be. It makes everything make sense to you when you understand why Satan hates Israel so much. Because that's where the Messiah is going to be. That's where the end of his demise is coming from. And that's where he's going to open up the books. And the, 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 and the, and the verdict is in. Guilty. 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 Your sentence, Lucifer, lake of fire. You're removed from the Lamb's book of life. And the dragon was in range with a woman. He went to make war with the rest of her offspring meaning the rest of the remnant of Israel. And who keep the commandments, who keep the commandments of Theos. They're obeying God. They know the truth now. And the truth is setting them free. And have a testimony of Jesus Christ. That means they now, being Jews, know who Elohim is, now know that the Christ, the one they missed the first time, is the Messiah. He is the Messiah ben David. And back to where they saw the woman, who is Israel, give birth to the child, which was the virgin birth. They were taken back in time and they saw what they missed and what their ancestors had missed. That we missed him. We missed him, but we're not going to miss him this time. We know who he is. He is the king of kings, the Lord of hosts. He is of his father David. And he is the son of God. And his kingdom will reign forever and he will rule over the house of Israel forever and the nations. We pray that uh, Revelation 12 has been a blessing to you. 12 is the number of completion to Israel. Isn't that something? Yeah, people always come back to me and say, God didn't when he wrote these scrolls. Well, we found out that they just found a, a, a book of Mark and they dated that back, uh, just some parts of the book of Mark. And they dated that back to, uh, I think it was 90, well, it was a little over 100, uh, 100, BC, 100 AD. So not too far after when that was written or the time of the, the book of Revelation was written. So that was the oldest known manuscript of the, of the Gospel of Mark. And what was fascinating about this is they said it was in a book, not in a scroll which uh, threw off scholars because they were used to the scroll. So the point is, People, when I say, well, this is Revelation 12 and 12 is the completion of Israel. And what are we talking about? The woman's giving birth to the Messiah. The woman is Israel. That is the completion of Israel. 12 is the number of Israel. 12 tribes, the 12 stars around, around the woman's head. Those are the 12 tribes of Israel. I say, well, God didn't do it that way. He wrote them in scrolls. But God is outside of time and space. He knew how man was going to put it into a book. Why do you think the book of Revelation ends in the number 22? It could have ended in 23, could have ended in 25, it could have ended in any number. 22 is the last alpha, it's the last uh, alphabet. It's the elf and the uh, elf is the first and the tav. And the ancient tav, symbol of a tav, 
in ancient Hebrew was a cross. That's how perfect God is. That's the last alphabet. He is the alpha, the omega. He is the beginning and the end. He's the alpha to the top. And the top is the 22nd letter in the Hebrew alphabet, the completion, and it's a cross. God knows all and he puts it perfectly in it for his perfect timing and perfect glory. That's what you see in one of the, in our study in Joshua, Joshua was a foreshadowing of the book of Revelation because Joshua's name in Hebrew means Yeshua as Jesus is Yeshua. He was a type of a coming Christ. And uh, all the kings of the earth, if you count them all up, at the kings of the earth that came after Joshua, that Joshua had to conquer, they came up with 31. Why 31? God doesn't do any numbers by mistake. Everything's perfect. 31, as we've taught in our gospel teaching, when, when um, uh, Pilate put on the king of the Jews in the three different languages, and you drop the Hebrew code on there, and it comes up with the unpronounceable name of God. It's four letters. And the unpronounceable yah, 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 uh, Yehovah, Yahweh, or, or the uh, Yuhevave is what the Hebrews would say, the unpronounceable name of God. Well, it's four letters. And so the symbol and the number of God is 31. His number is 31. It was Martin Luther uh, back, in, uh, back in the day of Martin Luther tried to get the book of Esther thrown out of the canon because this is, you know, he was, he was the one that came up with replacement theology. Well, what do we need this book of Esther? It's all about Israel before. The church has replaced Israel. Throw it out. Throw it out. We need it out of, out of, we shouldn't even have it in the Old Testament because there's no mention of God in the book of Esther. So it's just like God, if you, there's a rabbi code in the book of Esther, the name Yehovah, uh, Yehovah is in the God's name, is in code 31 times in the book of Esther. God is outside of time and space. It's just absolutely amazing. The more he does, the more he pulls back and you see the glory of the Lord. So there's more evidence today, brothers and sisters, of the living God through his son, Jesus Christ. It takes more faith not to believe than it does to believe because the days of Daniel 12 are before us. The knowledge will go to and fro. We will have the knowledge of the king that will be unequivocal, that we have overwhelming proof that it takes more faith not to believe in the Christ than it does to believe. We pray that Revelation 12 has been a blessing to you. And may the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Israel, bless you today. God bless you.